Okay, um, and well, if H is mean value zero normalized, so recall that you have if you have a symplectic form, then you take its top power, you get a volume form, so you can just integrate this function so at each time. I want this to have mean value zero because, uh, well, okay, then this correspondence is one to one. And obviously, uh, if you have two functions just differ by a constant, you get the same vector field and the same flow. So that's why you normalize. So that's just standard stuff. And uh, the time one map. I is Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. Right. So so far, nothing new. Um, okay. And what I want to look at is something like this. If you look at a sequence of such flows. And it converges to some so I mean you have for each time t you have a diffeomorphism so in the limit also for each time t I have a homeomorphism I'm going to explain this in a second and this is some function Then I want to define, I want to say this, I want to call uh, topological or continuous. More about that in a second as well. Uh, Hamiltonian path of flow or isotopy. And so I call it Hamiltonian. Yeah, just a topological Hamiltonian or Hamiltonian function. And the time one map here, that's this thing in the title, is uh, Hamiltonian. It's the next thing. I didn't tell you at all what kind of convergence I'm considering, so that's what I should do next. Um, but yeah, in general, the idea is that you take all your favorite objects you know and love from symplectic topology or Hamiltonian geometry. You look at some kind of limits, and uh, it's essentially that's uh, the crucial part is what kind of convergence I'm going to look at here. It tells me what kind of objects I get. So. Um, this convergence is in a sense. OK, so I have two things here. This one here, they are just isotopies. Um, so I have a path or, or isotopies on the manifold. And let me just start with homeomorphisms on that manifold. I want to 
say that distance is this. What does it mean? I choose any Riemannian metric on the manifold, and it doesn't really matter at all which one I choose. And so I get a distance function between any two points on the manifold, phi x and psi x, and I take the maximum distance of these two. And the same for the inverses here, and that looks maybe a little bit too fancy, but all it really does is I get the compact open topology. So I have a metric inducing the compact open, compact open topology, and um, the reason I have the second term here is to make it complete. So if I forget about this, I have uniform convergence, but it's not a complete metric. So a Cauchy sequence might not converge. And in this case, they always do. And if they have two paths, things like that. Yes. So this this will be complete, yeah. So a diffeomorphism will of course only converge to the sequence of diffeomorphism of course always only converges to homeomorphism, not it's not necessarily smooth. It's only C zero convergence. Okay, so and if I if I have a whole family, then I just take the maximum over T. And actually, that also induces the, on this path space, it also induces the compact open topology, and it's also complete. So this is this part here. All right. Um, The reason why I have that there is, I, I mean, I want to study limit objects, and uh, so I want them to be at least homeomorphisms at each time, so I can talk about this in a meaningful way. Okay, then this part here, um, if I have a function, let's say it's time independent, define the oscillation. Not much what that can mean. Just take the maximum minus the minimum. And if it's time in if it's time dependent, I essentially have two choices. I can integrate. Oscillation. So here maybe I put like like one infinity. So take the some kind of uniform norm and then I integrate. Here I just do the maximum. And what I want to define, I have two Hamiltonian path. Remember that means something you get like for each time you have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, and they're generated by functions h and k. Uh, then we call that Hofer distance. Let me write this and explain that what that means. So if you have any two, so if you have two Hamiltonians, I can look at something like this. So I say essentially two such paths are close. If I look at this thing here, I look at whatever function generates it, and I want that to have to have small norm. And that happens to be the same as just a difference of these two functions. 
So that's what I mean by this. This is my my uh, notion of convergence here. So on the one hand, uh, the isotopies do converge at the same same time. These Hamiltonian functions. So I have some topological convergence, but also use some kind of dynamical convergence of the energy functions. All right. Yes. So you have two options. Oh, sorry, say again, please. So, yeah, I mean, you have two options there for yeah. the normal gauge. So, do you get the same notion of Hamilton and memory morphism? So, for the, for the I, I had three things here, like uh, a topological Hamiltonian path and uh, Hamiltonian and the homeomorphism. And for the first two, like the path, uh, it's probably different. Uh, but for the homeomorphism, it's actually the same thing, yeah. But it's, it's kind of like, I mean, you have this Hofer norm, and there's also these two options, right? And so you can work with either one here. And, well, and so you can the path, right? so, okay. Exactly. Yeah. You have to perturb and parameterize and then do some tricks. Exactly. That's, what, that's exactly what you do. OK, um, so I more or less told you what is, uh, what is a Hamiltonian homeomorphism. Uh, by now, you're probably asking yourself, why? Is a Hamiltonian homeomorphism. Okay, let me give you some idea. It's a quick motivation. Um, so, for one thing, in many situations, In symplectic topology, uh, forget about the in. In many situations, the symplectic topology is actually topologically rigid. Uh, is topologically rigid, and by that I mean these well-known phenomena like C0 symplectic rigidity, just meaning that. If you have a closed manifold, you take any sequence of symplectic diffeomorphisms, meaning all those diffeomorphisms which preserve your omega, you look at C0 limits and you assume the limit is smooth, it actually also preserves the symplectic structure. Something that's quite bizarre if you just look at the definition, but it happens to be true. Also, a little less known phenomenon is topological rigidity of Hamiltonian loops. Essentially, means something like if you perturb the symplectic structure, the property of being Hamiltonian up to some kind of homotopy is, is preserved. So it's not dependent on your symplectic structure. I don't want to make this too precise, but this is a paper, I think, with the same name by Valond Mekta Fodorovic 10 years ago, I think. But they have a result that this, this property of being Hamiltonian is somehow topological uh, in an appropriate sense. And then two other well-known facts, non-squeezing So you can squeeze, uh, symplectic diffeomorphism can squeeze a ball to make it long and thin. And this is something like if you take limits, of course that's, that's preserved. Same as these capacities, these symplectic capacities, they do make kind of topological measurements. Uh, there's a lot of names here, so. Okay, so there's lots of situations where Symplectic topology, which by definition should be smooth theory, actually is, in some sense, topologically rigid. So this kind of is, is one idea behind all this. Okay, and well, we mathematicians will love inver invariants. Uh, that's all we do all day. Many invariants. Um, 
infinite, let me call that topological dynamical extensions. The kind of examples I have in mind is something like Hofer's norm. So if you if you look at the the way I define these Hamiltonian homeomorphisms, it's not too uh, uh, well. It's not too far fetched to to think there should be something similar, some kind of norm on this group. Actually, it turns out to be a group. There's some kind of norm on that which is defined more or less, or pretty much the same way as, as Hofer's famous norm or the spectral invariance and the resulting spectral norm. So you have, you define these invariants always using uh, these kind of functions. And in my, in this theory here, in my talk, they are, um, they are limit functions, so I can try to do something very similar. And that's, that's, that works actually quite well. Or the, the so-called, uh, I guess I'm going to write it down, continuous Calabi quasi-morphisms. If you have never heard that before, don't worry about it too much. But um, in a few short words, uh, if you look at the universal covering space of the symplectic diffeomorphism group, um, uh, now let me say the, the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism group, there are no homomorphisms on that because it's simple. Um, no, it's perfect. So there are no non-trial homomorphisms, they're real numbers, but there's something almost quite as good, these quasi-morphisms, and there's some, uh, some way of extending that, at least on the level of path. The same is true for the Calabi invariance. On the, on the level of path, you can extend this quite obviously. Okay. So. But I'm not going to say much about that, because uh, I want to talk for only one hour and not, not three hours. So. Okay. Oh, sorry. So far, uh, any questions? Okay. Um, yeah, one more thing. Uh, there's uh, this link between symplectic and volume preserving. dynamics. Obviously, if you take the top power, you get a volume form. So every diffeomorphism which preserves the symplectic structure should preserve volume, and so there's some, some obvious links. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, one word. Uh, I guess I should have said that at some point. Um, I'm going to look at a bunch of groups today in the ambient topological group. It's always the homeomorphisms on the manifold. And with the C0 metric I, I mentioned earlier, this is a topological group. And uh, everything is going to happen in here. So if, if I have some subgroup, writing a bar will always be the uh, C0 closure in there. Okay. Let's see. When did I start? Three? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, there's one more thing I should define. It's you know, like the, the structure group.
of the C0 symplectic topology is you just take oh, this one. Just take the C0 closure. So the symplectic homeomorphisms. And that kind of makes sense because um, recall about five minutes ago I said these uh, these things are fairly rigid. So for example, if I have something in the C0 closure and it happens to be smooth, it will be a symplectic diffeomorphism. And uh, everything in here will preserve capacities. Um, they will have the non-squeezing property and all these things. So it's actually fairly meaningful. OK. Um, where am I? OK, yeah, so um, maybe a few results. Yeah, now fairly easy, easy to prove is if you remember uh, the Hamiltonian homeomorphisms for a normal subgroup of the symplectic homeomorph uh, diffeomorphisms. So Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms are normal and symplectic diffeomorphisms and same thing is true if you move on to homeomorphisms. So if you are uh, if you have a symplectic homeomorphism, this subgroup here is always preserved. So it's, it's something that's intrinsic to the, uh, to the story. Okay. Um, and similarly, I, I want to actually focus on something else. It'll, it'll take a little too long. If you have some time, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, but uh, another thing that looks familiar is this group. Well, I haven't actually mentioned that. This is path connected. So it does sound an awful lot like, like Hamilton diffeomorphism themselves. Okay. So, and there's, there's actually quite a long list of things that once you make your definitions, uh, once you get your definitions right, and we experimented for a while actually, then you can prove a lot of analogs to the smooth theory. Okay, but let me actually, um, I opted to, to uh, focus on another question. So I have the what and the why, well a little bit of the why. Uh, what I want to talk about for a few minutes is uh, this one, is a Hamiltonian. Oh, what I mean by that is, is there non-trivial uh, dynamics or uh, Hamiltonian? So I spent some time defining this thing. Does it exist? You know, is there anything non-trivial? Uh, otherwise, I can talk for a long time and prove lots of great, great stuff, and at the end of the day, I have nothing. So um, let's take a look. So the first thing you want to think about probably is, um, you remember that I had these two objects. One is called the topological Hamiltonian path, which is a limit of the isotopies. And one I call the topological Hamiltonian, which is the limit of the functions. And um, you know in the smooth theory, I actually briefly mentioned that if there's one-to-one -one correspondence. Every function, every smooth function gives you a new, unique flow. Every unique flow, you can differentiate your vector field. Your vector field gives you the function up to a normalization constant. So these are, this is one-to-one -one correspondence. And what this first part could mean is, is there anything similar in, the, in this limit case? And there is. 
maybe I should write it like this, the topological Hamiltonian or continuous. I guess I use topological when I talk about this this norm boy had this subscript when I write continuous I should mean this subscript here. Um, path corresponding to topological or continuous Hamiltonian scenic. Or in other words, if I have uh, two have the same limit, These, uh, the sequence of, of generating functions, generating Hamiltonians at the same limit, then these two should be the same as well. So the same thing is in the smooth case. When you have uh, the same function, you have the same flow. And for the norm, There's also the converse. That's a theorem proved by Viterbo. Yeah, I guess. Converse. So if you have they have the same limit, and HI is the limit H, KI is the limit K then H must be the same as K. It's actually quite, quite uh, surprising uh, or quite amazing. And it uses actually some non-trivial things. Here you have um, the, the energy capacity inequality and some nice trick by Hofer and Zehnder. And this uses uh, uh, a theorem by Gromov on intersections um, of the zero section with its Hamilton deformations in the cotangent bundle. So, uh, These are some deep results. Okay, so so much for uh, uh, the path. Let's look at the Hamiltonian homeomorphisms. Okay. Oh, then yeah. What's the content of this theorem? The c the converse is that content. The converse so, of the first one. I mean, you wrote down the statement, but I don't understand what the statement means. It means that the the topological Hamiltonian. And I forget about this one, and I move it. I move this word over here. So the topological Hamiltonian that corresponds to a topological Hamiltonian path is unique. So if I have uh, one so-called topological Hamiltonian path, so a limit of isotopies, and I have two corresponding functions, the function should actually be the same. So if I have two different limits, I have a sequence of Hamiltonians that converges to H. As a second sequence, I have another limit K. They're actually the same. This. Why, is it, why is that question not trivial? Uh, because there's there's no uh, there's no dynamics. We ha we don't have a different equation anymore. So the 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 flow is not defined by taking derivatives and getting a vector field and and differentiate integrating the vector field. There's no vector field actually at all. So the limit there's no vector fields anymore. But the the the, the way that con the convergence defined actually is a way to circumvent having vector fields. So there's, there's only path and function, but no intermediate vector fields so that define the them. The point is that this ordinary differential equation x dot Oh, yeah. So essentially, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the, the Hamiltonian path, if you restrict to a point, it's just a solution to this differential equation this ODE. And uh, you can solve it uniquely. If H is differentiable and its vector field is at least uh, at least Lipschitz. 
then you have the existence and uniqueness theorems from ODE, uh, you always get a unique solution. But these limits will no longer be smooth, they will just be functions, maybe not even continuous functions on the manifold, but still there's some kind of unique flow corresponding to it. Yeah. Uh, this should be something else, yeah. Thanks. Otherwise, it's kind of trivial. Huh? <laughs> I can prove that too, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh. All right. Um. And to come back to Michael's question uh, from earlier, once you move on to uh, to homeomorphisms, um, the group we call Tamio does not depend on uh, okay how do I say that uh, the choice or I can work with either one one direction is trivial of course because one of these norms is stronger than the other. This one here is stronger, but of course it's not true in the converse. So this, but uh, like you said earlier, you have this uh, idea about Poltarovich of reparametrizing something. Once you perturb it, you can reparametrize, and uh, you have to uh, do a little bit more work in this case, but you can prove that these two things are the same. All right. Um, Okay, but I wanted to know if there's uh, if there's non-trivial Hamiltonian homeomorphism, if such a thing exists. And I have from just from the definition of these objects, I know that I can look at the usual Hamiltonian. Let me actually drop omega from the notation because it's always the same one. Uh, I have these Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, and of course each one of these. just take a constant sequence, it's the same element for every i. Each one of these is a Hamiltonian homeomorphism. And this was just the closure of the symplectic diffeomorphism as well. The Hamiltonian symplectic morphism is, is symplectic, so that's pretty obvious. Since it's only also path connected, I can restrict the identity component. And the question I what else? I vaguely stated earlier is are these proper subgroups? Or if the thing in the middle is the same as one of the other two, maybe I don't really have anything here at all. I'm just wasting an hour of time or a couple of years of time. Hopefully not the latter. Okay. Well, let me just draw a picture uh, without being too explicit. Maybe I call this one, two. Yes. Okay, good. I like that. All right. Um, so just look at a disk. And what I want to do is each one, each circle here will be fixed. And just rotate. Let's say I rotate a little slowly here, and I rotate a little, rotate a little faster here, and I rotate faster even, and then really fast towards the origin. And out here I just rotate a little bit, and near the boundary I don't rotate at all. So it's something that's compactly supported. So if I, some H say compactly supported in the interior of D2. And that means I can, I can take it, I can use the Booth theorem, and I just glue it in anywhere I want. So I can say yes, always. All right, so the upshot is if I, if I rotate really fast, um, this map will no longer be smooth. It will actually not even be differentiable, and if I, if I make it right, if I choose the rate of convergence here correctly, 
it's not even Lipschitz anymore. But there will still be a limit in the sense that I described earlier. You will still have some kind of functions that generate flows or, or isotopies, and the functions converge and the isotopies converge in the sense I described, and this will be the time one map of the limit. So if I make the convergence really fast, it's not smooth, but it is such a Hamiltonian homeomorphism. So if rotate really fast, Now if I rotate really, really fast, but not really, really, really fast, <laughs> then, then it will still be a homeomorphism, and actually it will be a symplectic homeomorphism, because I can write as a limit, a C0 limit of error-preserving maps. Um, so it will, be, it'll, it will be lying in here, but it may not lie in here. So actually, two, it should not. Because, like I said, if I rotate not quite too fast, but really fast, no, really, really fast, I said, uh, then it's not going to lie in here. But it, sh it, it's, it will still, it should not lie in here, but still in here. So actually, I don't know. So the answer is, I don't know if this is proper, but it should be, because I have this example. And so, uh, uh, one more thing. Uh, another thing that, that suggests this should, be, this should be smaller is, if you look at how this was defined, here you have something that uh, you have uh, uniform convergence or, or C0 convergence, and you have kind of C0 convergence and some dynamical convergence as well. And we all know that the Hofer metric and the uniform metric, they're not equivalent in general. Uh, so that neither one is strong than the other, so there should be there should be more here. There should be more restrictive. So this should really be smaller. I don't know. But I don't know, like I said, I don't know. Um, so and it's pretty bad. I don't know. And so since I don't know, let me let me do the next best thing. I can't tell you what the answer is, so let me make some excuses. So for simplicity, let's restrict to H1M, let's assume. Or I can also write that as Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms are the same as symplectic diffeomorphisms. Because you have this flux homomorphism and this is a kernel. So if, the, if H1 is 0, they'll be the same. Oh. Um, so if, if I don't make this assumption here, I'm actually making the question a little bit too easy. Because if I look at this, and the first cohomology is not trivial, uh, we can prove that this is proper actually in many situations using. Uh, uh, topological methods like fixed point theorems. Uh, so each element in here will have fixed points because we've seen this morning Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms have many fixed points. The limit will have fixed points because the manifold is compact. And here, if you take, say, a torus and you rotate, there's no fixed points. You can't approximate it by uh, by Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. So, uh, so using some topological methods, I uh, I actually get this inclusion here that it's proper. Or there's a so-called math flow homomorphism, and if you've never heard this before, it's just a topological version of, of the flux, the flux homomorphism. Uh, you can also use that to prove this is proper if you don't have this. And what I'm going to say is, is actually true in more generality. You have to just restrict to this, to the kernel of this math flow. Then 
you can do the same thing. All right. Um, so what we have before, we have this thing here. And recall this was just, I take all symplectic diffeomorphisms and I take the, the closure. Of course, if I look at volume preserving diffeomorphisms, take the closure and it's in there. And then, if we get back to one of the things I mentioned in the beginning, there's this relation between symplectic and volume preserving. And in fact, uh, if you take the uh, C0 limits, you get homeomorphisms, and the volume form should just be the top power of your symplectic form. Okay. So now what's my excuse that I can't answer this question number two? It's, uh, it's actually quite non-trivial, because it has some very interesting applications. Uh, so let me state two theorems that were proved by both Claude Graf and, uh, and Yongan that says if you take independently, if you, if you take a homeomorphism and it's a limit, let me write like this, a uniform limit or C0 limit of diffeomorphisms and suppose the thing preserves volume, then I can also make these diffeomorphisms volume preserving. And this works, for example, the dimension is less than the three. So, for example, on surfaces, any homeomorphism you have. Uh, can be approximated by diffeomorphisms. If it's volume preserving, you can make the diffeomorphism volume preserving. And if you look at higher dimensions, uh, if you have volume preserving homeomorphism and it's isotopic to the homotopic to the identity, then you get this hypothesis okay and so together this just means this is the same because every uh, homeomorphism which preserves volume and is homotopy to the identity I can, preserve, I can approximate it by diffeomorphisms. Oh, one important thing. Otherwise, it's not correct. I can't do it in four dimensions. It's probably, it's my, it's probably not true in dimension four. I don't know. Dimension 4 is always a little bit different. Okay, but all this means is I take a homeomorphism, it preserves volume, it's homotopy to the identity, I can approximate by diffeomorphisms, and then this first thing says I can make these diffeomorphisms volume preserving. And it's true for any time T map, so these things are this is the same dimension. Not four. Okay. Now, what does this all mean? Um, let's look at the most promising case. Well, it's called symplectic contact in low dimension topology. So let's talk about low dimensions uh, for a minute. Dimension is two. What do you have here in the middle? We have symplectic diffeomorphisms, we have volume preserving diffeomorphisms, but it's just the same thing on surfaces. The volume form is the same, it's a symplectic form, so.
and here this dimension is less or equal to 3, so that's the same as So I have this thing on the right hand side and I have a normal subgroup. So what this means if and this is my first excuse, if this is proper, then it's not simple. And recall that I restrict it to uh, the first cohomology to be zero, so this should just be the two-sphere. Um, but like I said earlier, you can do it for all surfaces. You just have to restrict to the kernel of the so-called mass wall. And this is a question. This is open since the paper of Fati in 1980. It's part of the thesis, actually. So uh, for about 30 years, nobody can tell you is this simple or not. And this is some kind of excuse why I think this problem is actually very hard. And we can't do it yet. So, but if we can prove this is a proper subgroup, then you get this for free. You can answer this question from back in 1980 that shows this is, a this is not a simple group. And there are some other approaches, but nobody's been able to do it so far. Not for lack of trying, I think. And if I look at higher dimensions, remember I have to exclude this case n equals 4, or dimension equals 4, sorry. So I guess my dimension is 2n here. Then the same thing. But now this one is known to be simple. So in other words, uh, I can reprove something that you all already know. If this is proper, then you have a new proof that symplectic is not these are dense in volume preserving. So, of course, you know that already, but uh, I used this as part of my motivation, but I never used that to prove anything. So, uh, so if you can prove some non-trivial statement in this zero symplectic topology, you actually get some results that are very fundamental in in its big smooth brother. It can't be C zero dense. And actually, by this Gromov alternative, we said either it's C0 dense or it's closed. You also have a new proof of rigidity. So, those are my excuses. If what we want to prove is actually true, we get some nice non trivial implications. So far, uh, any questions? Okay, how much time do I have? Six minutes? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, I gotta make this really quick. And so uh, I mentioned earlier that the analog of this uh, they defined the, the contact version. of this. Um, so they have very similar constructions to define what's called, I don't know what the correct notation is, so let me just use something like this, the group of strictly contact homeomorphisms. So your norms will be a little bit different, 
but the idea of defining these objects is very similar. Uh, they can take in topological and also uh, dynamical limits. So you also have, for every contact isotopy, you have a smooth function which generates that isotopy, and you have the same kind of convergence in the definition. And then you get these, these contact, um, contact homeomorphisms. And if you look at just the C0 closure of that, you again get some kind of normal subgroup. Um, I can even take the identity component now, and oh, and they also they are all volume preserving. Alpha, which the alpha to the n, the canonical volume form, and here the same thing. All right. Okay, so essentially, so this is what they proved here. You also have this this normal subgroup, and. Corollary. Um, so, well, I guess I should say this is simple, but I should restrict to uh, the first homology being equal to zero. So, think of spheres uh, S two n plus one in in this case. So the observation we made so it's work in progress still, uh, but one of the observations we made is you can play the very same game if uh, if you can actually show this is a proper subgroup, what does that mean if this is a proper subgroup, then well. Let's take a look. Let's imagine this was this were C0 dense in all volume preserving diffeomorphisms. Well, uh, if you can approximate any volume preserving diffeomorphism by contact diffeomorphism, if you could do that, you would have equality here as well. And you have a proper normal, normal subgroup of a simple group, which by definition I can't allow to happen, then the strictly contact diffeomorphisms are not if big if C0 dense in and I'm not much of a contact with to tell the truth so I don't know uh, how much is known in that direction but uh, here we have something we want to prove this is normal. If we can succeed, we have some kind of implication at least already for the smooth case. This can't be Caesar dense. All right. I could keep talking for a while, but uh, it's only yeah maybe one statement um, in the last two minutes is uh, uh, so what's a link between C zero symplectic and contact is uh, you probably know if you have your contact form and if it's regular meaning all the wave orbits are closed and say if period one you have this kind of so if of period one then we have some kind of quotient here symplectic structure and omega just a pullback no pullback omega I get d alpha and then 
There's a theorem by Banyaga, which is now generalized to this C0 case. You have an S1 extension. with the contact, strictly contact diffeomorphisms, with the Hamiltonian homeomorphisms. And they relate in this way. So for example, think, I should say, symplectic contact, low dimensional in one sentence, which is think of the Hopf bundle, for example. That's an example we actually want to look at quite a bit. All right, I uh, think I'm running out of time, so uh, I'm going to stop here. Thanks for, thanks for your attention.